Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. I'm here in uh, Colorado with Regenex founder and Chief Medical Officer Dr. Chris Centeno. Today we're going to talk about contaminated stem cell products and then we'll get to ask me anything. But let's start out with this topic because it's a serious thing. Yeah, so as you probably know or may have heard, you know, we had um, a very serious contamination with uh, a product called Livion. It was an umbilical cord product. And, um, you know, there were about a dozen people that got seriously ill that ended up in the ICU. Uh, basically what that means when I say contaminated, this had bacteria in it, had lots of different bacteria, but most or a large chunk of it was E. coli. Um, and so you probably heard about E. coli like in lettuce and stuff like that. Um, but this was E. coli in an injectable product. So this stuff got injected into uh, the low back discs, uh, epidural, and other areas. Uh, those patients got seriously ill and ended up in the ICU. Uh, I know that because I reviewed most of those cases. I'm the legal expert on most of them. Um, and then now, recently this week, I put on the blog that another company called Invitrix, uh, this company just had an FDA inspection where they shipped multiple, multiple vials of contaminated product, meaning it wasn't just the FDA showed up and said, we don't like how you're processing this, that could cause contamination. This actually was, hey, uh, you shipped a product that had hepatitis B in it. As an example, <laughs> that's obviously that, that means that someone was, it's awful to say, was given hepatitis B as a disease once they got this product injected IV. Uh, also Chagas disease was another one. Uh, bacterial contamination was also found. So, so this is now not the first time this has happened. We've been seeing multiple reports around the country of uh, this. We've been seeing local reports of it as well of people getting sick from being injected with these umbilical cord products. But now we're actually seeing concrete ev evidence of that. With the, with the Livion case, we had lots of concrete evidence. Now with this Invitrix case, it looks like there are many vials out there that have been shipped and these patients are gonna have to be followed up on. So this is a big mounting problem. And it goes down to how do you know if you're the patient or the doctor whether or not this vial of stuff that someone shipped you is contaminated? And the answer is there's no way to know. Who's supposed to oversee this sort of stuff? You know, the FDA is, is overseeing it, but the problem is unlike a drug product that has to go through extensive testing, and uh, in addition to that, that testing has to be done in every single batch where there's much, much more surveillance of all that stuff, these are tissue processors. And I think what happened here is that there were only five or six of these tissue processors in existence as of around five years ago. But because of the stem cell quote bonanza, we're seeing these fake stem cell products, these fake umbilical cord products being sent out. And there's now lots of very small processors who don't have the ability to do this correctly and it's causing a problem. So the answer is, the FDA, but it's going to have to. The FDA is going to have to change its process because this is simply just a 45-minute free online registration. There is no approval for any of these products, like there would be if they were drugs. So you're saying Hep B was shipped in a product, so they took it from someone who had hepatitis Hep B. B. Yeah, and uh, that got detected during the FDA inspection. Uh, but that means the product was shipped that had Hep. B virus in it. And this was uh, a uh, amniotic fluid? No, it's an umbilical cord umbilical product. Cord. So how many, I wonder how many vials they can get from that person who had Hep B that they shipped around? I mean, from reading the report, from what I can tell, uh, there were somewhere between dozens to hundreds of these vials shipped out of there. Wow. So I, I, they don't give an exact number. They give, they just give ranges of the number of vials that were shipped. But in one of the inspection report items, they talked to up to 100 vials were shipped. Wow, that's very scary. That's why you want to use your own stuff when you can. 
Yes, I would tend to agree that if you're going to be using any birth tissue product, it needs to be terminally sterilized. Uh, and anything that's being sold as live could have this potential problem. Boy, that's crazy. So a clinic owner might not have any clue what's coming in that could be contaminated. Correct. And who can run a stem cell clinic these days? You know, it's, it's yeah, that's another blog I just wrote. <laughs> I was sitting up in the mountains yesterday trying to figure out what to write about, and uh, I noticed that a patient had put uh, a, a website address for a, a clinic that had just popped up in his neighborhood in Michigan. So I went on there and just tried to look the clinic up, and I you know saw it was the standard chiropractor-owned clinic who the chiropractor was advertising umbilical cord stem cells. You know, I started to write about the fact that the umbilical cord stem cells had no stem cells, meaning these are dead products with no live stem cells. And then I started doing some research into this, the chiropractor, and it got weirder and weirder the, the deeper I dug. It turns out that the guy got, quote, an MD, PhD from a Caribbean medical school the Caribbean Medical School has since lost its ECFMG accreditation. That means that its, its residents can no longer attend U.S. residencies. Then uh, he lists himself as a faculty at a, uh, a Western Michigan medical school. I'd never heard of it, but I'm sure it's a legit medical school. Turns out that that's not really a faculty position, that in fact he's a resident. He's still in training. Mm at this medical school um, and so it just got weirder and weirder and weirder then I start looking up the the addresses for this guy's uh, medical school and I can't find where it is it's uh, supposedly on Mount Surat the island uh, but doesn't have a street address it just lists the street I can I look at the satellite photo and find one little collection of buildings that's probably what this is uh, it also lists Colorado addresses, but I can't find any place there. So it, it just get, got weirder and weirder. Wow, that is uh, not only the bonanza, but the uh, Wild West. Questions? Uh, no questions right now. Deborah says, uh, thank, hi, Dr. Centeno. Thank you for, your stem, for my stem cells. Uh, I continue to tell my friends that not all stem cells are the same. This is scary information. And uh, Mario... Uh, was asking Deborah uh, to share her story with him. Mario, do you have a question for us that we can answer for you? Thanks for tuning in from San Antonio. Um, so yeah, some crazy stuff going on out there. Um, but uh, why don't we talk about exosomes? That's another, yeah, that's, a, that, good that's a big one I saw today. Um, the chiropractors were pushing exosomes for all kinds of things, not only regenerative stuff, but immune system boost, just almost everything. Yeah, so that's an interesting one um, as well. So what are exosomes? Exosomes are um, basically little packets of information. They're how cells talk to each other, so cells excrete exosomes, so that, meaning they butt off the cell and they go to another cell. Uh, and the concept, uh, may be scientifically sound. We just don't have any clue as to how these things work or don't work in real patients. So as you know, there are thousands and thousands of drugs tested every year that don't really, that work well in you know, small animal studies, but don't do anything in humans. Um, so that's the place where exosomes live right now. There's some interesting lab data, some interesting animal data, but almost no human data at all, certainly not in orthopedics, that exosomes will do anything for anybody. Um, and yet this stuff is being sold out there. And that's coming from someone else as well, right? Yeah, these are exosomes from someone else. And uh, we also now have multiple FDA rulings that they shouldn't be selling this stuff, but they are selling this stuff. Um, and it's, it's just getting crazier and crazier. So could those be contaminated in a similar way? Or? They could be contaminated in a similar way because they're coming from somebody else. So again, they're not terminally sterilizing these exosomes. So the same problem could happen. Right, wow. Uh, Anne asks, uh, she'd love to hear your take on Baker cysts. 
Yeah, and Baker's cyst, just so that one knows, Baker's cyst is uh, a swelling in the back of the knees or a fluid collection in the back of the knee. Generally, it's just an indication that the whole joint is swollen and then some of that swelling will go to the back part of the knee uh, in some patients. Now, uh, Baker's cyst, from our standpoint, we, we drain them under ultrasound guidance before treating somebody because that can dramatically change how stem cells work if there's too much fluid in the joint to begin with. Um, at the same time, we've gotten rid of Baker's cyst by using sclerosing agents. And so if someone's got a recurrent Baker's cyst, that's a problem. You can not only drain it, but you can inject something in there to kind of close it off. Awesome. I think you answered this, but let's just make sure Jason asks, are exosomes the future? Uh, they could be, or they could just be a total flop. I mean, no one really knows at this point. Again, we don't have any clinical data showing that exosomes will help anybody with anything, certainly not anything from an orthopedic standpoint. So um, they may be the future, or they may be just a total bust. No one really knows. That's the hilarious thing, is that they're being used right now, but there is no clinical data whatsoever published. So that's a little bit like saying, you know, maybe uh, tea tree oil might be the future, but we have no clinical data that tea tree oil will do anything in your knee osteoarthritis, but it certainly has a good story behind it. It's a potent anti-inflammatory when rubbed on the skin, but nobody really knows. Right. And um, uh, our, our uh, I'm sorry, I'll come back. I forgot the question I was going to ask you. Mario asks... Uh, he has a call with Dr. Pitts on Wednesdays. Wednesday, are stem cells the best to help cervical spine? I have instability and also want some anti-inflammatory relief. Um, and when you say cervical spine instability, Mario, uh, you're t if you're talking about CCI, craniocervical instability, then the answer is uh, yes. To treat craniocervical instability, we'll generally eventually use stem cells in that PICL procedure. Prior to that, we tend to be more uh, on platelet-based procedures. So we generally start there. Uh, but if we do that PICL procedure, which is the one for craniocervical instability, we're using a stem cell or a bone marrow-derived stem cell to do that. Uh, here was my question. Are the costs for exosome injections, I guess they're injected, yeah, about the same as a, a autologous stem cell procedure? Yeah, it's, I think it's in the same uh, ballpark. You know, they're getting uh, significant, amount, significant amounts of money for exosomes, so you're buying those from a company. Um, but again, um, we don't know if they're contaminated, and more importantly, we have no idea whether or not they work at all. So, uh, Mario, I'll come back to your question, but let's keep on this exosome thing here. What about anecdotal evidence from many stem cell docs who tried using exosomes and have seen the benefits over stem cells alone? Doesn't that show potential in the products and should be looked into further? Uh, it should be looked into further, but the problem would be, at the end of the day, again, we have no idea whether at all that's the truth, meaning that Everything goes through a number of different phases in medicine. Uh, now, usually these things go through clinical trials, but again, there's no evidence at all like that for exosomes. So the first phase is the hype phase. Uh, everyone believes it works for absolutely everything. Uh, this is the best thing since sliced bread. After the hype phase, you get into the more reality phase of, well, maybe it doesn't work for everybody and everything. And then you get into the absolute, you know, clinical use phase where it's, where it's always, this works pretty well for only these types of patients. So right now, exosomes is in the total hype phase. Uh, I wouldn't believe a word a doctor said about how well it does or doesn't work because we, when you're in the hype phase, no one has any idea. It's just hype. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's kind of the phase we're in with exosomes and, uh, Again, I would say that, well, I'll give you a great example, Mario. So I talked to someone on the phone today because I got an ad for exosomes that came in that bizarrely came in from a local family practice doctor. So I, I just called the doctor and said, hey, did you send this to me? Oh, someone else, some other doctor I'm working with who's working with a company called Direct Biologics sent it to you. 
Um, and after speaking to this doctor, this doctor knew nothing about stem cells at all, had never used any stem cell product or any stem cells at all, but was telling me, extolling the, vir the virtues of exosomes, but he had nothing to compare that to. He'd never done anything. So again, you're, you're, if you're hearing that, you're hearing that generally from providers who don't know which end is up. This is all they've ever used for anything. Yeah, interesting. Mario sounds like uh, he's got instability from CO to C7. So uh, I think his question was uh, stem cells. He's talking to Dr. Pitts Wednesday. Um, yeah, probably better than to talk to, to Dr. Pitts who can look at all of your records, all of your uh, information and, and see what the best thing is for you. Uh, Murad, maybe you can be more clear on this, um, asks about stem cells or PRP, are they possible among very young athletes? What's very young? What's the youngest you've done? Yeah, so as an example, um, I just treated a 14-year-old girl. Her growth plates are not yet closed, um, so we did not want to use any stem cells in her knee joint. Um, so we just used PRP and some of the knee joint ligaments that were damaged. Um, so uh, comfortable using PRP in that situation, um, but not using stem cells when the growth plates haven't closed yet. Interesting. All right, uh, please send us some more questions. And if you know somebody who is looking into this or has a, a musculoskeletal or orthopedic injury or issue and they want relief, share this with them because as you can hear from this conversation today, there's a lot of scary things happening out there that doctors may not know about, probably don't, um, provide, uh, uh, suppliers are shipping around contaminated products they don't even know about, and uh, we want to help you steer clear of that sort of negativity. Um, let's see, Stevie asks, can you explain salamander-like cartilage repair capability? What yeah. is it and how does it relate to Regenix therapies or is this new? Yeah, so there was a blog <coughs> uh, I put out this morning. That blog talked about a study that looked at the age of proteins that were in, uh, cartilage proteins that were in the ankle, the knee, and the hip. And basically the, the newest ones were in the ankle and the oldest ones were in the hip. And that may explain why hips don't do as well, for instance, as knees. Uh, and there's other research that shows that too. Um, bottom line is, uh, there wasn't a lot new in the study other than the concept that the oldest proteins were in the, uh, were farthest away from the, or were closest to the trunk and the newest proteins in the cartilage were the farthest away from the trunk, i.e. the ankle. Um, how does that impact what we're doing? Not much, we've known for a long time that cartilage can regenerate itself with the right stimulus. And there are literally thousands of published studies on that. So this was a little bit of hype from the university, it was Duke, that put it out. And, and what do we know about uh, hip regeneration or, or improvement with stem cells from the registry? Yeah, we generally know that patients who are older, uh, who have more severe hip arthritis, don't do as well with a same day stem cell procedure as that same person who's the same age who has a similar amount of knee arthritis. So uh, this study, as well as others that have been published, was consistent with that. Why don't hip patients do as well? They don't have as much natural regenerative ability in that joint as they would, let's say, in the knee. Great. Uh, Kevin asks, how much improvement do CCJ instability patients usually receive from the first PICL procedure compared to the second, on average? Yeah, I would say that we're currently doing somewhere between two and four of these procedures on every patient. So uh, that gives you some sense of, of how much they uh, receive. So let's say the average is three procedures. Uh, so that would mean a third, a third, a third approximately. Uh, now we do have patients that tend to respond more, let's say to their second one or their third one. Uh, we don't know yet if those are technical issues since this is a new procedure or if that's related to some uh, property of their instability. Um, comment from Randy heard today that scientists grew living mouse embryos using only stem cells. 
Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting one. I'll have to look that up. I've not seen that today. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Send in some more questions. We've got uh, Dr. Centeno here. Ask me anything today. Okay, here's another good one. Uh, from T.O., uh, what's the best multivitamin to help stem cells get stronger before a, sem a stem cell procedure? Multivitamin. Um, I can't tell you a multivitamin. I can tell you um, what we know. Uh, we know that um, in the research that we did as an example, glucosamine uh, and uh, chondroitin are are good for that. We know that curcumin is good for that. We know that bitter melon is good for that. So we have a list of those supplements that we've looked at in the lab. Um, but as far as a, uh, a multivitamin, I can't point you in the direction of a specific multivitamin. Right. Uh, Mario asks, please explain platelet lysate, uh, nerve pain, and inflammation. Can you uh, directly inject into the muscles? Um, Mario, we can uh, directly inject into the muscles. So as far as platelet products in the muscles, uh, that would be more platelet poor plasma, which seems to work better in muscles. When, when it comes to nerves, that would be an ultrasound guided heart dissection procedure where we're injecting around the nerves to break up some of the scar tissue around the nerves. Um, so those are two different things injected in two different spots play the pore plasma in the muscles, play the lysate in the nerves. Kevin asks, uh, what are your thoughts on BPC-157? Yeah, you know, uh, I've got no thoughts, meaning that until we check this stuff in the lab uh, and then use it in patients, no thoughts. Again, Kevin, you got to realize that there's a list of about 500 things that have been shown based on lab studies to be really good with stem cells. Um, and exactly zero of those things yet have been tested in people. What is that? Is that a peptide of some sort? It is, uh, and I, I've gotten a number of different emails on it. All right. Um, Richard asks, uh, and I'm not sure about this question, how do you administrate stem cells? Yeah, so you've got to put them where they are needed, um, in particular, you can't give them IV, even though that's an easy, common thing that's done out there, because 97% of those will get stuck in the lungs. That's called a pulmonary first pass effect. And then uh, very little are going to get to the areas that we're generally interested in treating, because those areas generally have a poor blood supply. So you've got to put them specifically where they are needed. So let's say you're injecting uh, a knee meniscus, they've got to go into the meniscus, so that would be an ultrasound guide injection. Let's say you're injecting a knee ACL, uh, that doesn't really work very well under ultrasound, you've got to use x-ray guidance to do that one. Um, so that's generally how we will uh, administer stem cells, we will inject them either using ultrasound guidance or x-ray guidance depending on where we want the cells to go. Uh, Murad asks about indications for AC uh, dislocation. AC joint dislocation yeah. on the shoulder? Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I have a dislocated AC joint. i got to remind myself which one it is, my left. Um, and I had a grade three separation. Um, uh, we've not used stem cells on it. We've used platelets, and that's actually worked pretty well. Um, so for the most part, most of the patients I would see that have some sort of uh, AC separation, we would use a platelet-based procedure. Now I have uh, treated some patients who had more severe offset type AC separations um, with bone marrow stem cells. One that I can think off the back of my head did quite well, uh, meaning that he no longer has that uh, much of that step off. Uh, like he did when we started. Uh, that was a pretty impressive one, and he got full functional recovery without the surgery. Uh, Denise asks if uh, stem cells can help regrow uh, jawbone to help uh, with missing teeth. Regrow jawbone. So if we're talking about a fracture non-union, where there's been a fracture and that fracture is not healing, um, or there's some dead bone there, then stem cells can help regrow bone. 
Uh, but if we're talking about regrowing the jawbone to then regrow teeth, that's not going to happen. Ronald asks if uh, PRP is good to help with range of motion in joints. Yeah, Ronald, I'd have to know more to answer that question accurately. Um, I can tell you, for instance, that we will use various platelet products like platelet lysate, for instance, to treat things like adhesive capsulitis of the shoulder. So that's where you don't have full shoulder range of motion because the capsule gets shrink wrapped down and, and becomes scarred down. And we've used platelet lysate to literally stretch out the capsule um, in a procedure called a capsular distension procedure. And that works very well to get that range of motion back. So if that's what you mean, then the answer is yes. Uh, Richard asked two questions. Um, what type of stem cells do you use and can you inject into the lungs with a catheter? Uh, we don't do anything but orthopedic treatments. Um, you could uh, inject into the lungs with a catheter. Uh, it's possible to do, but that would be a pulmonologist who would do that. Um, and you could also inject in the blood supply for the lungs. Uh, that would be an interventional radiologist or interventional cardiologist that would do that. Uh, but that's not what we, we do. As far as what kind of stem cells we use, the only kind of stem cells that are available for use right now are stem cells derived from your bone marrow. Uh, anyone who's advertising umbilical cord stem cells, it's, it's a scam, meaning that there are no live cells in any of those products. We've, we've tested pretty much all of them at this point as has uh, Cornell and UC Davis. Um, so that's the only stem cells you got at the moment. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, this is a good question. Uh, what if you donate blood a month or two in advance uh, of a stem cell procedure? Would you not recommend that? Would it affect healing? Yeah, I mean, donating blood a month or two beforehand generally wouldn't be an issue unless you had some sort of anemia. So if you're a small person, uh, female, let's say, uh, uh, and have some anemia, um, normally then that could be a problem. You might come in with not enough blood on board, meaning we'll, we will measure the patient's hemoglobin and, and hematocrit before the procedure to get an idea of a safe amount of blood and or bone marrow that we can take. Um, so that could be a problem. But if you're the average person, probably not a problem. Uh, Deborah asks, do you still do stem cell expansion process in the U.S., or is that now part of an offshore procedure? Yeah, we don't do any kind of uh, stem cell expansion in the U.S. That's not legal. Uh, we have a licensed site down in Grand Cayman that does that, and uh, we'll take some of our patients there from Centennial Schultz that need that, that type of technology. Um, so we generally have doctors that rotate down there. In fact, Dr. Schultz is down there right now. Um, and I actually go next month. Uh, so that's, but we don't do any culture expanded stuff in the U.S. That's, that's not legal to do here. Stevie asks, uh, stem cells can help in the joints, but can it help with other body parts like lungs and breathing and eyes and seeing better? Um, I don't think stem cells are going to make you see better. <clears throat> um, they may or may not help your lungs. There's, there's less research on that right now. Um, so, uh, but we don't treat any of those other things because uh, we don't believe it's ethical to treat those things at the moment with stem cells. Um, Richard, I'll ask this question, but I'm not very certain on it. Does newborn baby stem cells work? Does a newborn baby stem cells work? Yeah, Richard, there's no place in the U.S. to get that. So if someone told you they're doing that here, that was a, a, a scam, so you should really run the other way meaning that uh, you would be talking about an amniotic, placental, or umbilical cord product. Those products are basically tissue taken from those areas uh, and then placed in a bottle. Uh, we've tested those. UC Davis has tested those. Cornell has tested those. Uh, the CSU Translational Research Institute, uh, just north of us, has, have tested those. And we've all found the same thing, that they're all dead tissue. So there are, there are no living stem cells in any of those products. So the answer to your question is, if you're talking about a U.S. treatment, uh, no stem cells at all, so that was a scam. Uh, now, you can get stem cells outside of the U.S. that are derived 
from, uh, for instance, placental tissue, uh, but that's not possible here in the U.S. Uh, Ronald asks is if, if it's possible to inject too many stem cells and what happens to the rest? Yeah, um, the answer is, if so I can only tell you from, let's say, injecting a knee joint. That's, a, that's an easy model for us to look at. So you can inject too many stem cells into a, a knee joint. As an example, if we're talking about uh, isolated culture expanded cells, then we won't go above 100 million within a knee, generally not even above 40 million in a knee, because we've seen very severe inflammatory responses if you get uh, much above that. Um, so the answer is, can too much of a good thing be a bad thing with stem cells? And the answer is yes. Uh, Mario asks if an atlas orthogonal chiro would be good uh, before CO through C7 procedure and would it help uh, keep C1 in place afterwards and offer a better outcome? Yeah, Mario, so when it comes to that stuff, we generally uh, want to make sure that if that patient has been using atlas orthogonal or NUCA uh, type chiropractic and they do well with it, that they continue that kind of work even after uh, the uh, procedure. Uh, now, we have other patients who just don't do well with it, and we tell them don't start it. But if you do well with it, and you, let's say, are held in place for three to four days or a week, then we'd recommend that you continue it. I saw one question come over my uh, Mevo, but it's not showing up here. I'm going to try to replicate what I read. Um, about an 80-year-old that either one had a knee replacement already, would this help, or an 80-year-old who needs a knee replacement, would this help? I, I, the question didn't show all the way up. So. Yeah, so it really depends a lot on the patient. So if you've got an active 80-year-old, and there are active 80-year-olds out there, um, there isn't anything in our data that would suggest that an 80-year-old would do any worse than a 60-year-old or a 40-year-old. With, a, uh, with using their own bone marrow stem cells for this type of procedure. Now, uh, if you've got a very ill 80-year-old, that may be a different story because there are 80-year-olds who are really in the end of life transition, if you will. So we're not talking about that group. And then if you have an 80-year-old who has had a knee replacement, who still has pain, then generally they didn't find the cause of the pain when they replaced the knee. So that could be some of the tissues around the knee that might need to be treated, or some of the nerves in the back that are causing knee pain uh, that the orthopedic surgeon who replaced the knee just totally missed. So uh, hopefully that answers your question one way or the other. Right, thank you. <laughs> um, Deborah asks, should parents have their infant's umbilical cord preserved in case they would need their own stem cells in the future? Do we offer anything like this? We don't offer anything like that, but uh, again, you have to realize, so for instance, if I was a brand new parent, would I save my kid's stem cells? The answer is probably no. Um, why wouldn't I save my kid's stem cells? Simply because uh, the like, there's only one thing that they're permitted to be used for right now, and that's a rare form of cancer. Um, so you're buying an insurance policy that can only pay off in an extremely, extremely rare case that your child has the exact type of cancer that those cells could be used. Your child can also use someone else's cells that are HLA matched for that same kind of cancer and there are umbilical cord uh, blood banks that have those. So I, I think it's, it's a scam, meaning that um, you're buying an insurance policy that can basically never pay off or pay off in such a rare instance that, and then you've got a plan B already in place for that instance. So I, I don't think there's any value in it. And by the time we get to the point in your child's life, uh, let's say 20, 25 years old, or 35 or 40 years old, where those cells might be used, we'll have far, far better solutions, meaning uh, lab created super stem cells that can do everything that, that are needed and your child's cells would be totally useless at that point. So again, I, I, I think it's a scam. I, I wouldn't waste my money. Ronald asks, is there a stem cell process for COPD? 
Yeah, Ronald, we don't treat COPD. Um, there are providers out there who are treating it. If you were to look for a provider, you'd want to look for someone who is uh, a pulmonologist, meaning that I wouldn't go to some random doctor who decides that he wants to treat COPD to make money. I'd go to a doctor who is a pulmonologist, someone who is a specialist in lungs, who has decided to add stem cells to their practice. Uh, uh, let's see, Stevie asks, uh, what, is stem cell, what is the stem cell ex expansion process? Who would need this outside of the United States? This is all new to her, and um, uh, thanks for the info on the lungs. Yeah, so culture expansion simply means that we're growing cells to bigger numbers. So that means that we take cells, uh, whatever we get, um, let's say it's this much, and we grow them in culture over uh, about two weeks to that much. Now, that's usually not needed for most of the things that we treat, uh, but there are some things where it is needed. Let's say we have a patient that comes in that needs stem cells in their neck and their back and their both knees and their right wrist and their left shoulder and their right ankle. Now we're in a situation where we can't even take enough stem cells in a same day procedure to make all that work. So now they're in a situation where uh, growing those stem cells to bigger numbers makes a lot of sense. In addition, it's even cheaper because we'd have to bring them back multiple times for multiple bone marrow aspirations, uh, et cetera. So those are generally the patients that need that kind of stuff. I wonder if you've seen this, Simran asks, had a, a total knee replacement, the hardware got loose, would, uh, would any of our work be able to tighten that back up? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. With hardware loosening, um, the, the biggest problem with hardware loosening is usually uh, it, it's loosened because there's a problem with a tissue reaction. Uh, so literally what's happening is that that patient is rejecting the prosthesis. Uh, they're either rejecting it because there's some uh, allergy to the metal in the prosthesis, nickel or cobalt is usually the case, uh, or they're rejecting the prosthesis for some other reason where their body doesn't accept it. So the problem there is going to be, if your body doesn't like to begin with, adding stem cells is probably not going to change that. Um, so the answer is that's probably not a good use of this this technology. Um, regrettably, the only answer usually there is to get the prosthesis removed and replaced with one that your body won't reject. <coughs> Excuse me, there's an excellent uh, physician, she's an occupational medicine doctor here at uh, National Jewish who specializes in implant rejection. And her first name's Karen. Let's see if I can find her name online for you. Um, anyway, keep asking me questions and I'll look for it. Is there a way to know in advance, I'm asking this, if you would have a metal allergy, like if you're allergic to jewelry, and I know people are allergic to earrings and necklaces and things like that, would that be an indication that maybe a, a hardware implant could be risky? Yes. So uh, if you are the kind of person who can't wear cheap jewelry, uh, usually cheap jewelry, uh, silver jewelry has nickel in it, then you should not get a, uh, a standard knee replacement. And regrettably, a lot of, there are surgeons who are now understanding this more and more, but we still probably have a large chunk of, of, of joint replacement surgeons that don't really ask those questions. In fact, I've got a, a personal family friend who probably is in the process of rejecting their Prosthesis, and I just actually referred her to this person. Um, so let's see if I can get that name for you. I think her name is Karen Pacheco. Uh, yeah, it's Karen, K-A-R-I-N, -K last name is Pacheco, P-A-C-H-E-C-O, at National Jewish. And we've been really impressed with her because she's one of the few physicians out there that will specialize in implant rejection um, and implant allergies. So I, I would highly recommend that you look her up. Uh, Richard asks if uh, the Cayman Clinic can do anything for uh, primary pulmonary hypertension. 
No, we don't treat anything but orthopedic problems. Uh, Mario asks, how many procedures can you do at one time, neck, shoulder, et cetera, not stem cell, but PRP, platelet lysate, hydrodissection, et cetera? Yeah, platelets are much easier. So we, we generally treat a lot of different areas when we're using platelets. Uh, Becky lives in Toronto, uh, would like to have DMX done, but there isn't one up there. Um, is it possible to fly in, uh, do DMX once? She's working with Dr. Rosa as well, it sounds like. Uh, do PRP and DMX in the same visit, have the results before you do any work? Yes, so you just have to set that up with, with staff. We have a site that's not too far from here, about 10 miles away, that, that does excellent DMX work, and uh, that could be set up very easily. Uh, Ronald, I'll get to your question as we'll use that as a good wrap-up, but um, uh, Kevin asked, with multiple bulging discs in the neck, do you think it's possible to restore a cervical curve or because of the lack of stability from the disc, would it not be possible? Yeah, so if there's lots of instability from the disc, so we would need to see that on uh, an active type of imaging. So that would be, let's say, DMX, just like we were talking about, where we're looking at active uh, flexion extension and a video of the bones moving. But if we saw a lot of that instability that seemed to be related to the disc, the disc can be injected as well. Um, so uh, that really just depends on, on where that's coming from and what that study would show. Uh, Ronald asks, is there any new or future stem cell process you are researching? Ronald, we do research all day, every day here. We have a large research team. Uh, I meet with them every two weeks. Uh, so as an example right now, let's see, they worked or they're working on um, multiple different projects, uh, some of which I can talk about, some of which I can't talk about. For instance, one of the projects that they're just completing now has been a three-year project on looking at the content of growth factors and cytokines in your knee fluid to see if that can predict all by itself who's a really good stem cell candidate and who's a really bad stem cell candidate. Um, and the good news is we believe it's possible to produce a test. Uh, so the test would basically be take a quarter cc of the synovial fluid in your knee send it off for testing, and the test would come back thumbs up or thumbs down for a stem cell procedure. So that's one of the many, many projects they're working on right now. All right, Nancy, last question. <laughs> How long after knee stem cell and PRP should I uh, wait before I get a follow-up MRI? Yeah, Nancy, it really depends on what it is we're looking for there. So as an example, there are things that show up well on follow-up <laughs> MRI, um, and there are things that we're not going to see change at all. So if you've got, uh, let's say, a knee ACL tear, generally we'll look at a follow-up MRI in three or four months to see if that knee ACL tear is healing. Or if you've got a bone marrow lesion, uh, generally, again, kind of four months to look at that bone marrow lesion. Uh, but if you've just got the average osteoarthritic knee with lots of lost cartilage, we're not going to see much change in the MRI anyway even if you feel 100% better. Um, so uh, it all depends what it is we're looking for. The questions just keep coming in. On the, the loose uh, knee replacement, it's been 15 years. <coughs> 15 years. Uh, do you think that's also still from rejection? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd have to know more, but generally what we see with those, so it's possible that what we're talking about is not rejection, meaning if it's only recently become loose, then that could just mean again that you just need a new prosthesis. Um, now, is it possible to get bone to grow in that situation? It might be, but you know, you'd probably need, if it's been 15 years, you're starting to get to the end of the life of the prosthesis. So most surgeons would probably want to take that prosthesis out and put a new one in, meaning that the next one's going to need to be a little bigger anyway, because the, the tunnels were, were putting these prostheses uh, get bigger from the first to the second. So uh, if you were five years out and it started to become loose, then maybe we'd be in a different situation. But 15 years, you're, you're starting to 
get to the end of the life of the prosthesis. Nancy, who asked about the repeat MRI, had uh, three, uh, three torn meniscus and grade four osteoarthritis. Yeah, we're not gonna see any difference on, your, uh, on, uh, on any MRI of the knee um, unless we're looking for bone marrow lesions, in which case we might see a difference there. So I, I would say go with how you feel and the MRI, the follow-up MRI is probably a waste of money. And Jennifer asks, I'm only 57, I love that. Got ways to go. Uh, you and me together, I think I'm 58 now. I gotta, I gotta think, I gotta do the math. <laughs> no, I'm 56, I'm sorry. All right. Uh, and was a paramedic for many years, had surgery, the rotator cuff tear, small bone spur, uh, right shoulder has arthritis and bicep tendonitis. Would stem cells help? Yeah, I mean, those are the kind of things that we treat all day, every day. Um, I, I would need to know more about each of those, meaning, as an example, what kind of rotator cuff tear. So of all the different rotator cuff tears that are out there, about three quarters of those we can treat. One quarter of those would be massive rotator cuff tears where nothing is connected and a stem cell injection isn't going to do anything. So uh, just like I said, we, we'd need to know specifically a lot more about those things, but those are the kinds of things we treat all day, every day. Great, thank you. Great questions. Appreciate all the interaction. If you know someone who needs to hear this, please share this with them. And let's wrap up with uh, uh, final words from you today. Yeah, I mean, you know, we started this conversation talking about the dangers of using, uh, quote, stem cells. There's no stem cells, but they call it stem cells. In a vial, let's say, for an umbilical cord vendor. Um, and we're seeing now evidence that many of these, uh, well, many, that some of these products are contaminated uh, seriously with whether it be hepatitis B or bacteria and you know, gotta be extremely careful. The only way to be absolutely sure that there's nothing in that vial that might hurt you is if it's terminally sterilized and that's usually with either gamma radiation or electron beam, but that means that all of it's dead uh, by definition. So that's the only way you can prevent that kind of thing from happening. So we would not inject a live or a product that claims it's live into any patient at this clinic. That's never gonna happen uh, until this, this product life cycle and the oversight from FDA gets to be better than it is right now. We will only use birth tissue products that are terminally sterilized for that reason because we're not gonna put our patients in that scenario. I'm not going to get a call from a patient three months later who developed hepatitis who claims it's from what I injected. Uh, that's not a good day for anybody. Right. Yep. Mario? Yes, every Monday, 4.30 Mountain Time. So we will see you all back here next week. Okay, thanks guys.